Okay, it's delicious. Um, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii. This is the movie show with George Kaysen. And we have a great movie to talk to you about today. It's called Delicious. It's a French movie made in the UK. And it is all about mm, the, the months and years leading up to the French Revolution. It's very interesting because it is about food. It is about the nobility. Um, it is about the common people. And uh, it is about a specific cook who works for the nobility and gets fired because he puts potatoes in a particular dish. Terrible, terrible, terrible. But there's lots to be learned from this movie. And uh, George, why don't you tell us the, the way the plot unfolds? It starts with this guy, Man Sharon, who is the, the cook, the chef. He's the head chef for uh, a duke. The, he's a head chef for the Duke. And, you know, he does the standard fare, you know, that the Duke wants, right? Then he figures, you know, do a little innovation, you know, he wanted to do a, a, a tart, an interesting tart, which he went with truffles, which is very, is it French delicacy, and he put potato in there, and then of course, butter and whatever. And it, it was a good, it was a very tasty thing. So uh, as, uh, as uh, he's, displaying this and some of the people are eating it, you know, they figured it not bad. And then a cleric, you know, leave it to a cleric to say, oh my God, potato, potato, that's for pigs, right? And then all these arrogant nobles, you know, that are sitting at this table, right? Really arrogant. They start laughing about what the cleric has said, pig, 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 and they're all laughing at him. So the Duke, you know, who initially had praised uh, Mancheron's, you know, fair, all of this stuff he cooked, tells him, uh, you know, Mancheron, you better apologize to these people because they're not comfortable with your potato and your truffle, you know, and your, and your tart. And he refuses to apologize because he feels, you know, it was initially liked. And just because this cleric comes up and says this, so the Duke, arrogant Duke, after years, terminates him. So he gets up, you know, and he gets all his personal effects together and walks back to the, the, ca the, the cabin where his late father raised him, you know, somewhere in the, in the rural area. And he's there and he, he He's sort of disgusted, doesn't want to cook anymore, just wants to, you know, just doesn't want to cook anymore. So lo and behold, a, a middle-aged woman shows up at his door and wants to be his apprentice. And he initially he tells her, I don't want to cook anymore. I don't want to do that anymore, because he's so traumatized by what this Duke that was his boss for so many years, right? And then she's insisting, she's insisting, she's insisting, right? That she wants to do this. And initially he's pushing her away and pushing her away and pushing her away. But she's very smart, you know, for, you don't know who she is initially. She, like you like, all the pieces haven't filled, haven't come together yet, but they will eventually as the, as the movie progresses, right? So eventually she can convinces him, even though she's a woman and even though he doesn't want to do it, she convinces him to start teaching. And as smart as she is, and then he's got a son with him because his wife passed away uh, after the son was born. He's got a smart kid who re reads Rousseau and very intelligent guy, right? Young guy, probably about 20 years old, right? So this woman, she has good ideas and she says, you know, People go to inns when they're on the trip, when they're traveling. Wouldn't it be a good idea if you could set up something where people could come and eat, you know, like out of their house, like Sunday or Sunday afternoon or Saturday or for special occasions, so they don't have to cook. Because in that day and age, everybody used to cook, you know, at home. And only rarely when they were on a trip would they go to an inn and eat. And the, the inn fare was really 
garbage. It was just crummy soups and maybe bread, not a normal meal. So they only, they didn't have their normal meals. And then his son, who's very smart, says, yeah, yeah, this is, you know, it's like for the public, for everybody, right? Not only for the nobles, but for everybody. So we're becoming equality, you know, that this whole age is fighting for equality. So they come up with this idea, and initially they think a lot of these things were a little bit manufactured because you, you know that this eventually started in Paris and not in a rural area, but it was in France where it started. And we'll ha let's have some tablecloths and tables and uh, have a menu <laughs> and, you know, and entrees and, 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 and appetizers and, and desserts. So the whole idea of a restaurant, right, was, this is the whole idea of innovation and becomes a big, big success, major success. And, and uh, the Duke had hired two or three other people and his wife didn't like them, right away got rid of them. So the Duke, you know, um, is going to come and uh, come to this, to his rural place on his way to Paris, right? He's supposed to come. And, and so the uh, Piacinc, who's the chief of staff of this Duke, comes to the place and says, I want you to set up something for the Duke and his royal helpers, you know, uh, other nobles, and, and have it at such and such a day at such and such a time. So initially there was a certain day, and then Piacinc, who's the chief of staff, contacts him with a letter and says, you have to do it two days earlier because uh, the, he's finished with what his duties and he's going to go earlier, right? So uh, they're knocking themselves out to get this thing together, you know, and they want to make an impression, right? And then when the Duke finally comes and oh, he's coming, he's coming, the entourage goes right through and, 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 and the Hyacinth sends him a letter, I'm sorry, the, the Duke was hungrier earlier, so we stopped at another inn earlier. So all this effort was for nothing. It was really pissed off, right? But this restaurant for the public becomes a major success. And then the Duke contacts Mount Chiron and sort of wants him back, you know, and, and he and Mount Chiron says, well, why don't you come and see what's, what's uh, you know, this is like, and I think the, the woman, his apprentice, had put that in his mind, right? So Mascheron comes, and Mascheron says, this, this is only for the nobles. This is not for the public. The public doesn't deserve anything like this, right? But they keep the inn open when Mascheron and his wife come, and they have all their other customers come in too, right? So Mascheron is really, really, really upset, right? Uh, that there's other, other people there. And he's smart. The, the Duke is upset. Uh, the Duke, excuse me. The Duke is upset. And he's, I'm sorry about that. Uh, and, and he's mouthing off, you know, about how this is ridiculous. And then all the, the people there in the restaurant, you know, the clients, right? Start disagreeing with him, you know? And, and blah, 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 blah. And the apprentice, this is the, the thing that I don't know if I want to reveal it now, but the apprentice, she has a plan, right? Who, who is this woman? Very elegant. But one of the things Mont Chiron said to her when she first came, she says, I know you, when she started to cook, she says, I know, I look at your hands, either you were a, a, a call girl, a prostitute, or you were a, the, the wife of a noble. And she, and she lies and she says that she was a pro prostitute and they treated her really well. Initially, she says that. But eventually we find out that you want me to say the, the, the punchline of who she was and what it was all about, or should we wait? Let's wait. Okay. So let me, let me join with you now. You know, that was a great rendition. Um, and you do have a fabulous memory, I must say. You remember all the details in that in that movie. 
But let's let's stop there. And uh, a couple of thoughts I want to bounce off you. Sure. sure. No, number one is the movie uh, was uh, was tremendous in its uh, its uh, its values, uh, its production values, um, its uh, its scenery, um, the uh, yeah the inside shots, the outside shots. It's beautiful. Uh, everything in the movie is like a painting. And it has been, it, it, the critics have reviewed it with that in mind. They have all, like, you, you know, uniformly found that this is a beautiful movie, a beautiful movie of France, uh, of, of the castle, the, you know, the Duke's castle, um, of, of the, um, the, the, the shanty building that uh, Mensron, you know, creates uh, a restaurant from. Um, I mean, the whole thing is uh, so, mm, uh, I don't want to say faithful because we don't know how things were, but it paints a beautiful picture of the way life was for them then in the French countryside. What's ironic about it is that the movie was not made in the French countryside. It was made in, in Cornwall, England, uh, even though it's shot entirely in French. And that's another point that um, the, the French is so good. The, the actors are so good, both uh, Manseron and Louise. Uh, you know the woman who comes to him, <clears throat> and the son. They're they're all heroes, uh, and and they're all uh, in, in such larger than life people. Uh, in you know, and you you get to know them, you get to live with them. And what I find interesting about Mansuran is that when he wants to um, express uh, an emotional reaction, it's so subtle, so understated. The same thing with uh, Louise and the son. It's understated. There's no overacting in this at all. You have to watch it carefully to see what they're really telling you. Uh, and I and you get to love that big fat guy. He's <laughs> he's wonderful. And Louise, you get to love her, even though she's a big question mark, as you said. Who is this woman? And the son is so devoted to his father. Um, one reviewer said this this movie has a purity, and the purity goes beyond. I think uh, the French countryside. It goes beyond uh, the dedication of this of this cook to his food, uh, the way he lays it out, the way he cuts, you know, his produce, the way the way he creates his dishes. This is an extraordinary cook. And you say, well, we have there's a lot of movies that are being made these days about food, but this is different than all of those movies about food. This was happening in the 18th century. Um, people didn't have the same view about food, even the French in those days. And, and as you said, um, you know, and, and I think you researched this because you know that the the actual development of restaurants as a way to serve food happened in Paris, um, not in the countryside. But that's OK, because it may have been happening parallel. We know this is not a true story, but there are so many true elements here. Um, and I think the truest one of all, and I'll stop in a minute, um, is that we are ramping up into the French Revolution. This is all happening just prior to the French Revolution. And when you see, you know, the way the, um, uh, the, 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 the nobility conduct themselves, see how obnoxious uh, they are and how they, they treat the, um, you know, the, the common people as lower, low life people. Uh, you realize uh, that what we have here is a real divisive society, and it can't continue this way. And you see it, you see it breaking down in this movie. This movie is really a study of France um, just before the French Revolution, what was happening socially. So food is important. These characters are important. But the biggest thing of all, as you mentioned, George, is that the common folk came in, enjoyed the restaurant, were together, and um, the hell with the Duke. The Duke became less important all the time, and 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 he was um, you know less powerful all the time. What I'm saying, and this is really a very important point about the movie, uh, is that the French Revolution did not happen on Juillet 14, July 14th, and the taking of the Bastille. It was happening for a while. It was happening before Marie Antoinette said, let them eat cake. And this is, that's very symbolic for this movie. Let them eat cake when they're starving. I, I guess you remember the scene where the young boys are stealing bread from the cook. 
and uh, Louise turns to him, or maybe his son turns to him and says, they're stealing your bread. Aren't you going to try to stop them? And he says, no, no, I, I want them to take the bread because I want them to appreciate what I'm doing and to know that I'm not going to punish them. Uh, I want to be at peace with them. And he's what he's really doing is making a political statement about food and people and the countryside. So what you have here is a is a, a view into pre-revolution France. And that is the most interesting thing of all. And the part that we held back on, this extraordinary conversation between Louise and the Duke and Montserrat, uh, when, it, when it all gets revealed, this is important because this is the kernel of the breakdown of the distinction between the nobility and the common people. Precisely. This is where they let the Duke have it good. So tell us how that went, George. Well, you find out that she really lied to Mancheron, that she was the, uh, the, the wife of a noble, right? And the Duke, the, uh, the Duke son of a really bad guy, right? Sort of had liked her, right? And, and, and wanted to take her away. In those days, horrible. Women were considered property, you know, they really weren't, you know, uh, so he wanted to take and, and she, she refused to go to leave her husband and go to this Duke, right? Um, so one of the things on his, on his side, when the chief of staff was stopped by the restaurant, right? She hid her face because she figured someone would recognize her, right? So then at the restaurant, when the clientele starts screaming at him, she goes, she, she, she finally reveals who she is, right? That she's uh, the wife of the Duke. And what this Duke had done is created all kinds of problems for her husband. And she thinks, because he ended up hanging himself, her husband. And they don't, they don't, she thinks that maybe the Duke had her husband hung. So her whole plan was to become a, uh, an apprentice so she could poison this guy. <laughs> she figured this was her whole plan because she was so angry, you know, she was going to poison him. So well, she, think, knows how to, she knows how to do that. Yes. She tried to make poison before and uh, she, she um, you know, she decided not to do it and threw the food on the, on the ground and, and all the chickens came around and ate the food and they all, they all turned exactly. upside down dead. Exactly. Uh, so she knows how to make poison. Yeah. So the thing is, bottom line here is she reveals herself and she tells the Duke, I can poison you. Now, you don't know if the, when the movie's ending, did she really poison him? Did he go back and die, the Duke? But he runs out. She, she pulls off his, his wig, right? You see his, his head without, without the wig. You know, they, they were all wearing wigs. And this happens three days before the storming of the Bastille, as you were saying. So this was all leading up to the French Revolution, you know, with Marie Antoinette losing her head and, and the, the, the royalty being pulled down, you know. So the, the, the movie ends three, day, three days before the storming of the Bastille. So when, when the French nobil the royalty fell. So really interesting. I, Unfortunately, you don't know whether she really poisoned him. They, they well, I think I, I like to revisit that with you. Yeah. Um, when she tells him who she really is yeah. and how she is seeking vengeance against him, yeah. he is in the process of eating the food from Ezra and he spits it out. Uh, uh, with, you know, the notion he spit it out because he thought, you know, she was poisoning him and she had good reason. But she says to him, if you remember, she says, no, I'm not going to poison you. I'm not going to do that to you. I missed that. Okay. And then, and then we have, uh, you know, a very interesting moment where um, the, the, the woman that he's with and the Duke himself is saying, you are putting us in a restaurant where these, these lower, than, lower than low common people are sitting next to us. We can't possibly do that. And that's when she pulls off his wig. And she says, no, you know, you're like the rest of us. And we don't accept your, your uh, you know, your extravagance and your claim to power. 
But then, and this is really, really interesting, he says, he says to her and to Mansuran, uh, this is the, the, the core of that meeting. He says, um, I, I will have you, I will have you killed. I will have you executed. Um, and he's a duke, so uh, you know, possibly he could do that. But then she steps in and she lets him have it. If you want to do that, just threaten us one more time, and I am going to report you to the king for killing, I guess, her, her husband, uh, and a, a bunch of other things. She was collecting data on him. She had four or five things that he had done um, in violation of the, you know, the king's uh, commands. And, um, and she threatened him that she would go to the king and report him and that he would be in big trouble. Okay, and at that moment, the whole thing swings around because she said, uh, when she tells him that, he is stupefied and he has no answer. Um, and he has no wig on either at that point. No wig on. And, and you realize that his threat that he would kill Manseron is empty and that Duke or no Duke, he no longer has the power. She has un, undone him. Um, she has completely pulled the rug out from under him, and he can't um, assassinate or you know execute Mansurin. He can't stop the restaurant. He can't stop the the local people from coming in and eating. He's finished, and he walks out in uh, you know embarrassment and humiliation, uh, with and without a wig. Um, so he's just an ordinary an ordinary guy at that point. And so you know that's why I was saying before. Um, the revolution didn't happen in one fell swoop. It was happening. And this was an example of a woman talking back to him. And so, some of the nobility would talk to other members of the nobility, and they would point out that, you know, it, it, it's not sustainable. You have to stop doing this. Um, and so it's perfect that three days later, you know, we have the, the fall of the Bastille. But the, the, the Duke was, was done. She, she did him. And then Mansuran realizes what a wonderful woman she is, that she has this kind of strength that she could deal with the nobility and tell them where to get off. Um, and that is a really wonderful moment in the movie. It just blew me away. <laughs> yeah. You remember some of these the details. I guess I got caught up in visual and didn't listen to the words. Yet, right? So, right. But you know, this is a very good movie for what's happening today, I mean, you know that the, here in America and all around the world, you've got more and more super wealthy people. And, and the gap between the, the, the wealthy and the, and the not so wealthy is broadening constantly. So we're going back to an age like before FDR, you know, before the Gilded Age that we saw the movie, The Gilded Age, where you have the very wealthy, and then the middle class is deteriorating and losing, you know. I mean, a lot of the kids today, they, they can't even reach their parents' level of, of, of comfort and affluence, right? So we've got the broadening. So, so it, it's sort of a, a lesson for today, too. I mean, there's a lesson to what's happening in America and even in Europe and around the world with the super wealthy. So... Yeah, well, I think, you know, when we first spoke about this movie, George, um, you told me you were impressed with it because it showed innovation. Yes. Yeah, and, and here we have, um, and, and I think it was beyond Manserun. It was happening in other places, especially in Paris. Uh, a guy named Boulanger uh, had invented a restaurant in 1825. Uh, you must have done the same research I did. And this movie was set in uh, 1789. But in that period of time, the French were realizing that their, you know, their culture was uh, inextricably intertwined with food and with restaurants. And, and you know, this was a step forward that they still enjoy today. This was the development of the French culture around eating and food and preparation of food and exquisite dishes and, um, and lots of butter, I might add. He talks about butter in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> but butter, yeah. so which, what you have is in Mansaran, you have a, a person, he's kind of quiet. You know, he's not, when, when he's in charge of a kitchen, he's, he barks commands, but 
as an individual, his relationship with his son and with Louise and others around, he's kind of quiet. He's, he's an observer. He's a fair-minded observer. And he's seeing these things happen. He's observing. And if you want to look for a lesson, there, there is a lesson. This guy is an, is an everyman. He's, he's not a nobi nobility by any means. He's just watching the change in France. He's watching the change in food. Um, and he's being motivated by, by Louise, who is, you know, incentivizing him and encouraging him to get back and out of his depression and, you know, into what he was born for. Um, so what, what they're really what they're really doing, I think, is they're they're observers, they're fair minded observers to the changes in France. And as a, as a couple, as a team, uh, a three person team, I should add, because they're all contributing to the innovation. They're all contributing to making him the great cook that he was born to be. Um, they are, you know, they're giving us um, a model to follow today, uh, a model of watching and participating in breaking down the division, you know, between the nobility, even today's nobility, <laughs> and, and the ordinary people. And I think we, we learned from that. We, we learned that there's a way to observe and participate and innovate uh, to bring the various factions together. Um, and that's what this movie, to me, that's what it leaves us with. Now, his son was reading uh, Rousseau, you know, so a uh, political treatise, you know, so uh, the son was really uh, right on top of what was going on right before the, the Bastille, right? So the son was a pretty smart kid, you know? Yeah, well, I remember that early in the movie, his son was using a library in the Duke's uh, castle um, and the Duke caught him. Right. And you can't use the library. You're a commoner, you know, exactly. and you people don't, you people don't read. We don't want you reading. And, and then he made other comments about the food. They said, you people, you know, can't appreciate good food. You have no idea what good food is. And you'll never know. And it's up to us, the nobility, to know. Uh, and we are the only ones who can appreciate the reading, the library, so to speak, and, and the food and the cooking. Um, and you say, what the hell is this? What is this guy saying? Can he get away with that answer? No. And you're right. Um, the boy was um, a statement of the future. Uh, so was Manseron. So was Louise. It's all statements of the future. This is what France was going to be like. Um, and the boy was certainly going to be an activist, a reader, a thinker, a philosopher, um, a great character. They were all great characters. And I, and I admire, you know, whoever selected them for the for the movie this was the, the acting was excellent and you had to stretch your neck to find out what was really going on you had to stretch your neck to figure out what they were thinking and 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 why and um, and you had to follow the action i uh, i as I, I told you before i the 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 best uh, literature and, and the best movie making is when the character changes in front of your eyes and all three of them changed, uh, including the mystery woman, Louise. She also changed. Um, so you, you admire them as individuals. You admire them for their contribution to the French society. What would you give this, what would you give this uh, as a rating, George? I give it a 10 because of, of the historical aspects of it, the acting, the beautiful scenery. In every respect, I, I thought that it was hitting a lot of good 10 points, so I'll give it a 10. Really liked it. Yeah, I would too. And uh, I, I, I wait for more movies like this. Uh, it's a statement of how good a French movie can be. Uh, it's a statement of how, a, you know, nonviolent, there was never violence in the movie. Um, threats maybe, but no violence. Um, and, you know, it was, a, it was a head trip, this movie. It was a historical, I wouldn't say documentary, but a, a statement of, of the history of France and the history of the 18th century. Um, so this is the kind of movie I really like, and I hope we see more of them. And I, you know, some people may look at this movie on a one-dimensional basis and say, oh, another cooking movie, another movie about food. No, 
That's not it. That's not it. It's much more than that. <laughs> you know, for me, I enjoyed this movie, even though I'm vegan. And the kid said, uh, some, you know, his son said uh, something about eating meat you know, creates aggression or something. So that was a little tidbit for, for people with my dietary <laughs> choices, mm -hmm. right? But I still enjoyed him making with the, you know, he would put, make the eggs and he would put the butter and with his hands, you know, they showed his hands, you know, cooking and stuff. Similar to when we were, we watched the pig movie where you had that famous chef that went out into the, into the woods, right? And you could tell from the way he was handling his hands with the cooking truffles, you knew that he was a master chef. Same thing with uh, Nashiro, you know, just showing his hand movements as, as a chef. Yeah. Interesting, really interesting. interesting. Interesting to focus on food in that way. It's a cultural, philosophical, um, you know, way. It's, and it, it also points out that we are in a time, perhaps, uh, you know, in, in a, um, you know, a, a pivotal time when food may not be as plentiful as it used to be. And so uh, all these movies are really saying, you know, you got to appreciate every little morsel. Um, don't, don't take it for granted. <laughs> well, thank you, George. Uh, we'll find another one in a couple of weeks, but I think we, we, uh, we've had a good one this time and we have a good track of appreciating these movies. And I really appreciate, uh, you know, you watching them and remembering the details and researching them. And we'll do it again soon. Thank you, Jay. Sure. Thank you, George. George Case and a movie reviewer par excellence. Aloha. Jay, Jay, also par excellence movie reviewer <laughs> as well. <laughs>